you know about children, right? We always talk about children as being, uh, what to say, so innocent and so full of uh, life and how very special they are, how they <coughs> help you age faster. And then there are all these cliches about children. Child is the father of man, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, you know, all those things. But um, if we really want to make uh, children, child, the father of man, we need to get them to read books, to introduce them to reading and to tell them stories. If we want them to become uh, responsible, uh, empathetic members of society, grow up to be that. But, and for that, that is where children's literature comes in. But unfortunately, and I think you'll also agree, children's literature is often taking, taken for granted. In newspapers, in media, generally ignores it or gives it some grudging importance. But when Children's Day comes, then they suddenly wake up. Just like when uh, on 8th March, everybody wakes up to Women's Day. We have to celebrate women. We have to talk about uh, women. So we have these uh, times when uh, suddenly uh, children become important, children's literature becomes important. But even in literature festivals, you find that the time slots aren't particularly attractive, and the venues are almost hidden somewhere. You know, it's almost like we're apologetically having some, something there for uh, children. So, there is, that's how it is. And what happens is, uh, it, this has happened to me not once, but several times, when I'm introduced um, as a children's writer, you will find the other day it was a lady, and uh, she just she immediately, she gave me a broad smile, and she gushed, oh, how lovely. How wonderful, she didn't say oh, tweet, but uh, she uh, came pretty close. And she said, I am, see, I have a two-year-old daughter. No, so she said granddaughter, and I will get her books for you. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll get your books for her. See, she did not even ask me, she probably thought I wrote pop-up books or uh, picture books. She didn't uh, try to find out what kind of books I wrote, what my target um, reader is, what exactly um, I like to write. Probably she did not even know my name. <laughs> and this happens, you know, it may not always be the granddaughter, it might be a niece, it might be a friend's child who's having a birthday, one and a half year old, your books will be, butterfingers will be perfect. Um, so uh, that is how it has been. And then they also ask me, why don't you write for adults? As if, you know, I'm honing my skills, <laughs> and um, I'll take the next step to writing for adults. Actually, I have two books for adults, but I, they just happened. I did not write them to prove a point. And talking about this, I'm reminded of this um, American writer, a children's writer, whose name is Kate Kleiss. So she said that she was dating a physician, but she realized that the relationship was doomed when one day, when they were driving, he just turned to her and asked her, so when are you going to write a book for grown-ups? So then she said she just laughed. But later, she thought she should have told him something cleverer. You know how all these late retorts come? So then what she wanted to say was, do you ask a pediatrician, when are you going to see grown-up patients? <laughs> So if pediatric medicine is not a lesser kind of medicine, why should writing for children be a lesser kind of writing? And another misconception is that it's very easy to write for children. It's not, let me tell you. So there is this famous French um, neuroscientist uh, whose uh, name is Stanislas Duen, who has written this book, which is called How We Learn, the New Science of uh, education and um, the brain. So he is talking about how very important uh, it is uh, to learn to learn. That's what he says. You must learn to learn. And he says that uh, children, uh, he says we are, it's amazing how we are born with uh, our brains have an immense plasticity to change, to adapt. We are not born wired 
to think of, you know, to uh, have everything, to have the knowledge to face the world, to face the challenges in the world. But we have to acquire it by studying the environment around us and by using our brains, which has the plasticity to adapt. And he says, we are not just homo sapiens, we are homo docents. That is, we are the teaching animal. We are the species that has learned that has to learn to that learns to teach so we have to teach and he says the sooner you learn the better the sooner you learn to learn the better and he says it is education that is very important and the more you educate yourself the better for your brains and he says every time every year of education takes you so much further in your IQ, your IQ rises by a few points. So he said, then he comes to, so we understand how important it is to feed the brain, to make the brain think, to give impressions for the brain to work upon. And he says, babies are exceptionally receptive. They are actually, they are machines, you know, they are um, questioning machines. They are waiting to uh, absorb what is around them. So we have to, you know, we have to take, we have to influence babies. We have to talk to babies. We have to tell them things because they also are fine-tuned to understand language and also uh, numbers and geometry. These are the special skills that they are born with. And they are born with circuits all highly organized to take in what is given from outside. So we have to give. And that is where children's literature comes in. So children's literature brings all this to the child. So children's literature gives a child language skills, gives the child um, life skills, makes the child change into a better person, more better behavior. And children's literature does not mean only books written for children. It also means music. It also means songs. It also means rhymes. All these come under the broader, uh, 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 the broader heading of children's literature. So when you think of lullabies, see, lullabies are what uh, a mother sings to a child to make the child sleep. And that actually the child is innately, uh, it loves music by nature. The baby loves nature. And there's a bonding between the mother and the child. Now, don't think that lullabies are gentle. There is this oldest recorded lullaby, which is, uh, I think it was in 2000 BC. It's a Babylonian uh, lullaby etched on a clay tab uh, tablet in cuneiform script, which is actually threatening the baby with dire consequences if the child, if the baby cries. And the mother is singing, <laughs> oh baby, you will be, the demon will eat you if you cry. And she's singing this very, very lovingly. But never mind if the, uh, whatever the words, the child responds and the hypnotic quality makes the child go, go to sleep. This is probably the first instance when uh, somebody is going to sleep by listening to something and they carry it into their adult life. And in classrooms, when the lecture is going on, you sleep. <laughs> so that is how it all started. So then you have the picture books, very important, because the child gets to know about colors, shapes, numbers, uh, people, animals. Actually, uh, it is storytelling, no, it is the it is the bridge. Picture books are the bridge between storytelling and nature, environment. And that is very important because when children see pictures of uh, nature, mountains, rivers, and animals, they are in, there's a feeling of curiosity in them. And they want to know more about animals. They want to know more about nature. And there is that connect with nature, which is so very, very important. So then you have the uh, uh, nursery rhymes. You know, I'm just talking about how education is gradual, 
but very exciting and stimulating. So when you come to nursery rhymes, singing nursery rhymes, because children love music, so they love to sing, it actually makes them um, absorb a lot of new words, so their vocabulary increases, they also, in the, and their grammar increases without learning any grammar rule. You know how you hate the grammar rules. But if you learn nursery rhymes, it's never bad grammar, so you learn that. And it, let me tell you that just like lullabies are not gentle, nursery rhymes, fairy tales are also not very kind. They don't have very soft and sweet um, stories. So there was a critic who actually found out in one volume of nursery rhymes, 10 murders, two choking deaths, <laughs> one decapitation, and several other acts of violence. You may be horrified, but I was happy. Not about what <laughs> he wrote, but that a critic actually thought gave importance to nursery rhymes. Enough importance to actually sit there and count and look at it with great interest. So now let's just take, see how a nursery rhyme can make you, can, can help you along, can tell you life skills, life skills, life lessons. So I'll give you a nursery rhyme which you are probably very, uh, quite familiar with. Piggy on the railway. Piggy on the railway, picking up stones. Down came an engine and broke Piggy's bones. Ah, said Piggy, that's not fair. Oh, said the engine driver, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, strangely, when I was uh, small, we had another version, an Indianized version. I don't know whether you've heard of this one. Piggy on the railway, picking up stones. Down came an engine and broke Piggy's bones. Ah, said Piggy, that's not fair. You must give me a hundred rupees. <laughs> 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So look at all these. There is, of course, the child has, is being, has been cautioned not to go to dangerous places, but it's gone. And because it's gone, there's been danger. And then the engine has broken his bones, terrible thing to happen. And you have an engine driver who is totally callous, very mean, I don't care, he said. But look at the Indian version. We Indians, no, compensation. <laughs> We want compensation, we want money, and we want 100 rupees. So there is uh, counting, there is... Uh, Numbers, they're learning so many things. And I hope the child does not also learn that even if all your bones are crushed, you can sit up and talk sense. You know? <laughs> because that is what Piggy is actually doing. Then we come to fairy tales, which also teach um, a lot about uh, how life is, trials and tribulations of life. You know, that, uh, but one thing is, because of the black and white nature of uh, uh, the fairy tale, the child kind of senses that this is not happening in, his, in the real world. So there are uh, these fantastic creatures, magical creatures, but the child understands and is secure in his um, home and understands what's happening in some other world, that it's not, life is not a bed of roses, but also realizes that because it's all black and white, whatever difficulties uh, you have, the heroine will kiss the frog and all will be well. So even if they are introduced to terrible characters, witches, imps, horrors, they realize that, and it's a good thing that they, they should know that there are bad characters also. It's not always good characters that you find in the world. So they know all that. They should find that that, that actually helps them. Uh, but they also know that good will triumph in the end. And Therefore, they also learn to be kind, good, generous, humane, all that happens. Take, for example, Ugly Duckling, which is about not fitting in and being bullied for that, being bullied because you don't conform, you're not like the others, because so many children go through that, and they have this comfortable feeling that they're not alone. And when the, uh, the Ugly Duckling turns into a swan, then they are taught, don't go by appearances. Then you have the Emperor's New Clothes, my most favorite fairy tale, which I think is very relevant today, which teaches a child not to go, not to, uh, that is, to speak out its mind, to believe what they see, and to say, speak the truth. And in other words, 
not to, and not to have the herd mentality, then you have Red Riding Hood which teaches you do not talk to strangers. And you have Pinocchio which tells you, yes, that if you tell lies, you will get a nose job done without plastic surgery. So whatever kind of book they are reading, you are reading, you know, what the child reads, whether it is Alice in Wonderland, whether it is Harun in the Sea of Stories, whether it is House at Butterfingers, you are introduced to different worlds, different words, different um, kind of people, different ideas, different styles. You know, there is so much, such a wealth of riches that you are absorbing while you are reading and all so very quickly. I mean, so very unconsciously, so very spontaneously that you really and love what you're doing and it also makes them empathetic, very important because you have to empathize for social and emotional development. So that is how important it is to read, not just for uh, the child to read because the child reader becomes an older reader. See, when we were growing up, we only had uh, books to read and outdoor games to play. These were the only two recreational activities and we did them with great joy. That was all that we had to do. But now it's becoming very, very difficult. It's very challenging to get a child to read, to get the child to open and read a book when there is that one instrument wonder, the mobile phone sitting there with all its <laughs> distractions. How do you get the child to read? That is the greatest challenge. So I think what the Older people, if the child has become a reader from the time he was small, well and good, once a reader, always a reader. But otherwise, I think what they should do is don't force a child to read. Don't push, shove your choice of books down their throats. Allow them to browse, allow them to choose their books. You do not ask a child to read when you are looking through your own phone. When you are know, looking at the phone and telling the child to read, that's not giving the right message. So you have to read yourself have books in the house, make the, have healthy discussions. And if we keep doing that and make the child understand there, is, there are so many worlds inside books, there is so, so, there is so much of uh, joy inside books, that reading is at bottom pleasurable, that reading is a joy. That's the message they should get. And that is what I hope uh, will happen. And if that happens, we can hope for a better tomorrow. So thank you very much and happy reading.